I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel is rumored to have bombed jihadists in Syria. An Israeli chef is taking a stand against sexual harassment, and a famous Israeli psychic has just confessed how he cooperated with the CIA. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Airstrikes in Syria have just killed at least 10 fighters from a militant jihadist group with ties to the Islamic State. Sources on the ground have accused Israel of carrying out the attack, though no evidence has been offered and the IDF has given no comment. Friction has certainly been spiking between Israel and Syria lately, and though the army has carried out airstrikes there in the past, those are usually Hezbollah targets or retaliation attacks. Just last week, Israeli jets returning from an intelligence mission in Lebanon were fired upon by Syrian anti-aircraft rockets. The jets retaliated by destroying the Syrian weaponry, igniting a tense war of words between Syria and Israel. <laughs> מי שמנסה לפגוע בנו, אנחנו פוגעים בו. היום ניסו לפגוע במטוסנו, לא מקובל עלינו. חיל האוויר פעל בדיוק, במהירות, והשמיד את מה שצריך להשמיד. אנחנו נמשיך לפעול במרחב ככל שדרוש כדי להגן על ביטחון ישראל. No evidence has been offered at this time as to why Israel is believed to be behind this new attack. And many doubt the IDF would carry out such a risky operation given that it has little to do with Israeli security. At least 10 casualties have been reported from the airstrike on the Jahish Khaled bin Walid group's base close to the Golan Heights. The faction is not officially part of the Islamic State but has pledged devout allegiance to it and its mission to spread terror. With the internet comes an overload of information. It can be hard to know when the news you're taking in is really true. Well, Israeli journalist Ben Dror Yamini has been tackling this very problem for years. And today we have him here in the studio to tell us about what he's learned. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us. So, so you wrote the book, The Industry of Lies, in 2014 about the lack of accountable yep. reporting in the media. Uh, and now that book is being released, or has been released in English, correct? Yeah, yeah just uh, some two hours ago. Two hours ago. So yeah. it's fresh. It's fresh on the Completely. internet for all of you yeah. guys to snap up. Yeah. Now, do the observations in your book still hold true today? And tell us about some of those ah, observations. It's, it's becoming even much worse. I mean, actually, I could, uh, I could write two more books since... Uh, um, three years ago when I published my book in Hebrew. Um, I'm not dealing with politics. I'm not dealing with politics. I'm dealing actually with the two main bodies of information, namely academia and media. And those two bodies produce so many lies. I'm sp speaking about lies. I'm not speaking about criticism against Israel. Criticism is legitimate. I'm not... Uh, I'm not uh, a big supporter of uh, the current Israeli policy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with the legitimate uh, uh, criticism. It has nothing to do with the political debate which is taking place in Israel, and fairly so. Okay, it has can, to you do go, with can you give us some examples? Oh, yeah, I can give you. When a professor from Columbia University, you know, Columbia mm -hmm. Ivy League University, is publishing an article saying that uh, Netanyahu called to expel all the Israeli Arabs from Israel, or that uh, uh, yeah. in Tel Aviv there are no Muslims who can live. There are only one city in the West without, an, I mean, come on. And I mean, it's going on and on. And when uh, another professor uh, is telling that uh, the 9-11 commission uh, wrote that actually they did it because of the Janin massacre, well, there was not any massacre in Jenin. It was not written in the report. And uh, the Jenin story was one year later. I mean, so, so many lies in one article of a very... Um, so, a so, very known professor in the United States. It's just, uh, I mean, I can give you... Uh, but, and it's so just so interesting examples. because these things, uh, you know, come out in the media and... And, and, you know, people eat them up, right? So, so is your book trying to help people learn how to, to hold uh, the media accountable? And if so, how are they able to distinguish yeah. what is it's true coming, and what is not? It's actually, it's coming. My book is dealing with, uh, 
with uh, many le levels. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the historical level, what really happened here in 48, what is Zionism? Because when professors teach their students that what happened in the Nakba is one of the worst crimes in modern history, it's a blatant lie, and I explain why. Why? Because it, in that time, in the first half of the previous century, mm -hmm. it was the standard population exchange. When they don't know it, when Israel is singled out by the so many professors, Israel is depicted as a monster, and that's what they do many times. And no. it's going on, and, and it's, it's the same about the conflict. What happened, for example, with the Clinton uh, well, that's what, I, that's what I want to ask yeah. you about. Now, now let's turn to what is going on right now, present day. Uh, you've been following the Israeli-Arab conflict yeah. quite obviously for a long time. Yeah. Um, do you think that we are going in circles with the Palestinians? How is this Palestinian unity deal that we're seeing come out right now going to really have an impact on, on the deal? Look, when we are talking in politics, um, I have to admit that I don't accept, I don't uh, really like the current policy. I think that Israel should tell the Palestinians, for example, the unity, uh, the new coalition between the Hamas and Fatah, why not to welcome it and to say, accept the preconditions of the quartet, not of Israel, don't put more conditions, welcome it. Say, yes, why not? You know what? Let them say the no. Don't you, and maybe Israel, uh, uh, say, but, but this is the current policy. When we are talking about peace, there is a huge lie about it. I mean, what happened in the so many proposals of John Kerry, of Clinton before him. So what is the Kodazer. truth? Tell us the truth quickly that, because we're that, running that, out of again, time. Again and again, Israel said yes. And when you read the media people and the, and the, the university people, the academia people, you find out that actually Israel said no, which is just, just a blatant lie. We have the original documents, we know what happened, but yet they obscure everything or that they uh, lie, unfortunately. All right, well, listen, thank you so much for joining us, Ben Dloriamini. We would love to hear you know, more about the work that you're obviously doing, so we're going to have to hold this for our next interview. Thank Thanks you so for much. coming in. Thank you for hosting me. All right, the Israeli Knesset has just reconvened to kick off its winter session, announcing an ambitious new agenda for the coming season. But some items on their to-do list have ignited some controversy from none other than Israeli President Uvin Rivlin, who just aired out his concerns to the entire Israeli parliament. After a three-month recess making plans for the coming season, coalition lawmakers and Prime Minister Netanyahu himself took to the podium, and it looks like they have their work cut out for them. The ambitious list includes a new law for expanding Jerusalem's municipal border by absorbing surrounding settlements. Another top-line item is pushing the Jewish state law, which roots the country's Jewish identity further into physical constitutional law. But many have noticed that a few of the biggest items on the agenda involve sidestepping recent rulings from the Supreme Court. Those would be the court's reversal of the country's law to exempt the ultra-Orthodox from army service, and the court's decision that deporting asylum seekers against their will is unconstitutional. Netanyahu's coalition is now promising to rewrite those laws, which would bypass the Supreme Court's rulings altogether. President Reuven Rivlin was clearly disturbed to hear this, prompting him to grab a microphone himself and slam the Knesset for making a continuous attempt to weaken the gatekeepers of the Israeli democracy. The president warned that the government's pattern of undermining both its own courts and the press was opening dangerous floodgates. The stateliness has gone from our country, he lamented. After us, the flood. The entire world is finally starting to speak up against sexual harassment in every industry, and now the Israeli celebrity chef Alon Shaya is taking a stand as well. But sadly, it looks like he was just fired from his own restaurant for doing so. Shaya was the executive chef at three different restaurants, the, Dominica, the Dominica, Pizza Dominica, and his own restaurant, Shaya, all of which are owned by the Besh Restaurant Group in New Orleans. Well, he was, that is, until he decided to speak with reporters and expose the owner's history of covering up years of sexual harassment claims. 25 women have all come forward and accused Besh of fostering a long history of rampant harassment, both physical and verbal. Shaya says that when he first heard about the claims, he immediately believed the women and pleaded with the owners to set up a proper HR department to address the problem. 
pleas that ultimately fell on deaf ears. But even though he's been fired for taking a stand, losing his own namesake restaurant, Shia feels he's gained something as well. No one should feel unwelcome, afraid, or insane in their place of work. He wrote on Facebook, harassment is not just a part of kitchen culture. The restaurant industry does not get a pass. All right, well, Israeli media exposed the massive fraud of the binary options industry last year, a web of scams that defrauded up to $10 billion a year from users all over the world. And now the Knesset has unanimously voted to outlaw the industry once and for all. Well, returning to the studio with more on this is ILTV's Aaron Porras. Aaron? Well, it's as you said, they finally unanimously, the Knesset unanimously voted to kill the binary options uh, enterprise in Israel and finally put an end to the scam. What's more is that this, this all started in, with a March 2016 article broken by the Times of Israel's Simona Weinglass. So, it's so reporters actually uh, still make a difference, uh, right? Indeed, uh, apparently it would uh, appear that we do. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, people across the world are probably celebrating right now. I mean, this, this issue has really affected lives everywhere. People have lost their life savings. People, their lives have been ruined. People have even died. So this is a big win. Wow. Well, well really let, let's, let's hear more about it now in your piece. Absolutely. The binary options industry has been operating relatively unchecked in Israel for the past 10 years. It wasn't until last year that a bombshell Israeli report exposed the epic scope of the graft, which nabbed between five and $10 billion per year. The problem is that this money is essentially stolen from customers who are tricked into putting their life savings into short-term investments where the system is rigged to never pay out. Binary option sellers go to great extent to conceal the ruse with fake identities and misrepresented products, and as it turns out, their location too. Hundreds of these firms have been operating in Israel, employing thousands of Israelis who went on to defraud customers all over the world. The FBI recently arrested Israeli binary option CEO Lee Elbaz in JFK Airport, but to date less than 20 Israelis have been arrested with zero indictments thus far. But finally the Knesset, at least, has taken the problem seriously and passed a new law to shut down the multi-billion dollar industry in Israel for good. All binary firms in Israel now have just three months to close shop or else face up to two years in prison. Now, we all get a little stressed come tax time, but now there's an even bigger reason to be honest on your forms. Israel just caught an Israeli man buying a watch overseas for almost $3 million who had reported that he made less than $20,000 a year on his income forms. Yeah, buddy, that's kind of suspicious there. It turns out the Israeli tax authority had some help on this one. And guys, this is why you shouldn't lie on your taxes. It's because many foreign tax authorities actually notice suspicious big ticket purchases like, say, a 10 million shekel watch bought by a visiting tourist and then report it back to Israel. And these reports are completely voluntary. Israeli accountants in the government then cross check the purchases against what their tax file says in Israel. And needless to say, a red flag goes up when the numbers don't quite make sense. In this case, the suspect reported only 60,000 shekels of income a year. That's among the lowest, poorest tax brackets in Israel. So clearly, he may have neglected some of the fine print when he reported his taxes. All right, well, they say diamonds are a girl's best friend, and that's especially true in Israel, home of the planet's largest diamond exchange. And right now, the floor of the trading room is especially hot. That's because everyone's there to catch a glimpse of the peace diamond, the 14th largest diamond ever found in the world. Israelis have gathered from all over the country to see the enormous gem for themselves. The world-famous peace diamond weighs in at a whopping 709 carats. Wow, and, and it was discovered earlier this year in Sierra Leone. The African country has been rich in diamonds for years, something that has come at a bloody cost. Regional disputes over diamond mines ravaged Sierra Leone with horrific, a horrific, horrific civil war for decades, coining the term blood diamonds. So why is this one called the Peace Diamond? Because a leading international diamond network, the Rappaport Group, which has a headquarters right here in Israel, is holding a totally free auction for the gem. And the majority of the proceeds are going right back to Sierra Leone to help rebuild the war-torn African country. You know, there's a reason. There's a reason God... Funny, I don't know. It's an emotional thing. But... There's a reason God gave these diamonds to the poorest people in the world and made the richest people want them. This is tikkun olam. 
this is making the world a better place. It's beautiful to hear. All right, well, finally, there's some good news for cooperation between Israel and the Palestinians. No, it's got nothing to do with politics, just good old Mother Nature. 400 first responders from Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Jordan, and the European Union are all coming together to help prevent international forest fires. A massive two-day Middle East forest fire drill is currently underway, bringing together around 400 firefighters from all over the world. The Palestinian Authority has three teams of 45 first responders in the mix, shoulder to shoulder with squads of Israeli firefighters. They're all training together to help anticipate and prevent horrific forest fires that might cross international borders in the future. The European Union is sponsoring the drill, adding crews from France, Spain, and Italy to participate as well. And all parties, regardless of politics or nationality, are proudly working together, aware that if a natural disaster should strike one day, only teamwork will win the day and save lives. Let's hope this is the kind of cooperation we see more of soon. It's estimated that roughly 15 million babies every year are born prematurely. Preterm babies face a massive uphill battle on the road to full health, so one of the most important things that doctors can do is closely monitor them every step of the way. Well, joining me now in the studio is Merav Oflivax, the CEO and co-founder of Blue Fairy Med, to tell us how her company helps to do just that. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us. Hi. Now, this is a very interesting topic. <coughs> tell us, what is Blue Fairy and what is your product? So, uh, Blue Fairy is, uh, tech, is, is integrates textile and technologically to one uh, textile cover, smart textile cover, that monitors the vital signs in premature babies in the hospitals. Interesting. And it's, um, it's bringing a more holistic approach to, t to take care of babies in the hospital. It can, it's shorter the time and allow more uh, progressive and holistic care to those uh, who need this care, uh, from the parents to the medical team, and eventually, of course, the baby that it's a very silent customer and doesn't have doesn't Much, have yeah, the ability right. to call, really to call for help. Doesn't what's happening. Yeah, so that will help eventually. That will help to bring a more easy care mm -hmm. without it's a, it's a, what Blue Fairy is doing. It um, integrates all the ele ele electrodes and wires to avoid okay. the spaghetti situation that you are you can't take the baby uh, and uh, to, to take the baby with right, you. Right, because when you see the typical image of a, a premature baby, you know, is covered with wires and, okay, so continue. Yes, so, um, and that's allowing a, a more uh, approachable treatment, uh, which allow eventually a more involvement to the parents in the NICUs, in the intensive care unit, yeah. uh, uh, beyond shorten, shorten the, the treatment time of the medical team, it will bring the parent to be more involved in the care of the baby, which wow. is more very important. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, how did you come up with this idea? Tell us, is there a story behind this? Yeah, so four years ago, I was in Boston, and um, I was uh, very surprisingly uh, took birth of uh, my son Daniel, my youngest son, wow. uh, in uh, very early, in week 30. Wow, um, wow. Ended up very surprised and scared in the hospital. Um, being there for three and a half months, almost three and a half months, I come across this hard situation when, first of all, to see him with all this, you know, small creature with all those wires and adhesive electrodes was scary. Yeah. Um, and you really don't sure. used to see this small baby with all it looks like a robot. It was almost hard to get attached to him. Phys yeah. Uh, to touch him, I mean, to just touch to, him, yeah. to hold him, only, yeah, and eventually, when I remember, once I I got I, I took him from his crib and something started beeping, and I needed from that end I needed the nurse to help me every time to take care of him, and the notion and that's that so scary for you, the notion that you could hurt your own yeah, child, that I can hurt him, that I don't know I don't know if things are working, and and you know to feel that my baby is always tied up to those machines that I can't take him home. It's a constant reminder to see all those wires around him. It's a constant reminder uh, to know that he's in the hospital. Yeah. And I was wondering, I am a product designer in my professional, and I was wondering that what if the, I could just put everything in a one texture wrap that will uh, cover, that would look a little bit more like the, the, the clothes that we're putting at home, you know, right. more design, uh, uh, has more design uh, um, aspects in it and uh, will be more... Um, less frightening, yes, I guess. Yes, less frightening. And uh, that's why we came with this idea. Well, I have amazing. it uh, with my friend, my, my co-partner is Shawon. She came from the medical team and together we uh, 
established Blue Fairy, which is, by the way, it's, the, it's Pinocchio's fairy, the one that cut the Pinocchio, uh, Pinocchio roll. Oh, yeah. interesting. So that's why so that's the, the name, name yeah. From. Well, this, I mean, I think that, you know, what you've created is something that is going to impact so many people's lives because people don't realize, you know, how common of an issue this is. So, so what is the next step uh, for your company? So we hope through um, our activity to first bring more awareness to this issue. That mm -hmm. and, and, and most of all, we hope to change the way we treat premature babies in the hospital, to bring a more holistic care, to bring a more um, um, uh, easy care to the premature babies, hopefully all over the world. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Merav, and good luck. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, let me just check the year here. 2017, well, I could have sworn it was the future. That's what you'll be saying in about two minutes after I tell you about an insane breakthrough from Israeli scientists who just figured out how to make food using 3D printers. Yes, you heard me right. Like something straight out of Star Wars, a new technology from Israel's Yassoum Research Development Company claims to have cracked personalized food that's printed from nanocellulose. Nanocellulose is a morphable fiber that can be modified with all the essential food components, proteins, carbs, and fat. And when combined with the tech of a 3D printer, which by the way can cook, bake, fry, and grill while it prints, the result is personalized meals made practically from scratch. 3D printers can even tailor your meals down to their texture or make them gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, or customized for your diet. This is a kind of sci-fi innovation that doesn't just make life easier, but it could be a critical life-saving invention for starving countries. And personally, I cannot wait to taste test a 3D printed quiche. The famous Israeli psychic Uri Geller is back on the map and he is using social media to reel us right back in. Well, ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here to tell us about his latest post. Yes, Natasha. Well, first of all, for those who don't know who Uri Geller is, he's a famous, or some would say infamous, Israeli illusionist and self-proclaimed psychic known for his trademark TV performances of spoon bending and other illusions. In a recent social media post, Geller claims that he might be mentioned in the JFK assassination files that he notes US, U.S. President Donald Trump is not preventing the release of. Geller goes on to describe having supposedly helped out various secret services, such as the CIA. Other than talking about the files, does he mention anything specific that would have us believing he was really involved? Well, as you know, a lot of people are and have always been extremely skeptical when it comes to Uri Geller's abilities, but honestly, from reading this post, I really don't know what to believe anymore. Geller goes on to say, quote, for decades I wasn't able to talk about the secret testing the CIA carried out on me until the CIA released millions of documents. He also mentions President Trump's decision to declassify the documents on the JFK assassination that would ultimately be released by Thursday, which include over 3,000 top secret documents never before seen by the public. Well, this is really interesting. You know, I recently did a piece on another famous Israeli mentalist, Leo Sushelt. He swears that he doesn't like to involve himself in politics, but I guess we'd never know if he was working with an organization like right. the CIA. He actually did work uh, for the IDF during his service on some top secret cases, but I'll have to keep you guys posted on whether or not he opens up and spills the details. Definitely. Thanks for joining us, Emmanuel. Thank you. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, fame. Lots of people fight for it and want it, whether it's good or bad. So today's word of the day is mifulsam, which means famous. Today, it's easier than ever to become mifulsam or mifulsemit for all of our women out there. Just check out Instagram. Ugh, the internet has created a newfound social media stardom that leaves a whole lot more people with a chip on their shoulder. Check out this guy. You make it as if you aren't like super stoked now that I'm in the room. You pretend as though like you're not graced by my wonderful appearance feet from you. He was joking, I, I think. Really though, being with Fulsam can be a good thing leading to money and success, but don't forget it doesn't guarantee happiness. Remember, a life with fame can be a good life, but fame without a life is no life at all. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 65 or 18 degrees Celsius. 
Tomorrow is expected to remain clear to partly cloudy with a slight rise in temperatures with a high of 83 or 19 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.5 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kierchuk, and thanks for watching.